Hello, my fellow drumsticks. I'm Snare. And welcome. In today's video, I will be teaching you how to make snares. This is somewhat of a beginner tutorial. So if you're like a complete beginner, this may help you get better at synthesis. If you're somewhat intermediate, this can help you get into actually making drums. And if you're a more advanced producer and have no knowledge of how to make your own drums, this might just be the right place for you to start with. Because snare drums are generally the thing that is the most prominent when it comes to drums in any song, right? When you hear a snare drum, that's sort of what makes you think of drums. You don't think of a kick when you talk about drums, you think of a snare, right? So with that said, I need to introduce myself for the new people here. I'm Snare. I'm a music producer. I've been a producer for soon to be five years, actually. I've done music for video games. I've done sound design too. I'm a pretty good sound designer, I would say. Both music sound design and other types of sound design, like organic. Yeah, I've done other tutorials on my channel too. Right now, I only have the Kicks one. That's a full length tutorial that I consider to be really high quality. And I have some shorts explaining some techniques that are more advanced. Generally, I'm going to try and cover more advanced things on the channel but I thought since drum synthesis isn't that well covered on YouTube, especially cymbals, which I'm going to get to later on, I thought, hey, let's do an actual Patreon quality series with really high quality visuals and really high quality narration and everything and give it out to everyone so everyone can learn. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, today I'll be looking through how to synthesize a snare drum, a very basic one. Let us start by explaining what is a snare. If you don't know what a snare sounds like or you need a little bit of a refresher, you may be newer or something. So these are some of the snares that I made for my sample pack. Really clean and really nice, right? When you're talking about a snare, you can also refer to an item that takes the position of a snare. So when I say snare, I may also be referring to a clap. This is a clap or a rim shot or anything of sorts that would take the place of a snare. In this video, I'm not going to be showing you how to make these because they would require different tutorials. Instead, I'm just going to be showing you how to make the actual snare drum that has a fundamental and all that stuff. So now that you know what a snare is, let's talk a little bit about the physics behind it. It's very similar to a kick. If you've watched my kicks video, you'll know that the way it works is basically it's this sort of round chamber, right? The cylinder that is not very tall and it has a membrane at the top. It can be made out of plastic, can be made out of other materials. That doesn't really matter. What matters is more so the fact that you'll be hitting it. So the membrane, which is the part that needs to be excited, you will be hitting it with an exciter, that exciter being a drumstick. So you hit your membrane and what happens is the membrane vibrates. It creates a sharp sound. That sharp sound reverberates inside of the chamber. The chamber can be made out of metal, wood, plastic, other stuff. It creates a very short reverb that extends the fundamental of that snare, the of the snare, right? That hum, the note. It also sort of stretches out a bit the air in it, the the noise, right? The initial click the is the actual hit of the snare. And it's not just that actually, it's a little bit more complicated when it comes to snares. It's not like a kick because I actually have a snare drum in my room. When you're hitting it, it also has this rattle inside of it that's made of metal. And it's like a bunch of chains linked together, right? From side to side and it's stuck on the bottom of the snare. And what happens is when you hit it, that chain rattles and it creates like a layer to the sound. That's sort of why a lot of military snares and such uh, sound very rattly because that part at the bottom, that rattle, which is actually the snare itself, that part is what gives it the rattle. That's why marching snares and such, they have that electric high end in them that is very um, protruding in a song because of that rattle. So yeah, when it comes to actually making it, it's yet again very similar to a kick, just that it can have a lot more flavor and you have to keep in mind the way that you work with it. There's all sorts and types of snares that you can make. As you heard, there's endless amounts. It all comes down to the way you actually mix your layers. So I'll start off first by creating the dushk, the tone of the snare, which I will be using a sign for. Then I will layer on top some noise, which will create the shh, 
stone of the snare, the actual snare rattling, which I can shape in whatever way I want to give the snare different qualities. And next, I will be layering it with a transient, transient being the, the initial click of the snare. I will be putting all of them together. I will be compressing them in different ways so I can get a very even tone out of it. And I'll be using several effects like equalizers, filters, transient shapers, or distortion to basically maximize it and make it standard studio quality. I'll be doing all of this inside of Faceplant, but you're free to use anything. It works in any synth. You can even do this using uh, the mixer tracks in FL Studio and using multiple triple oscillators or something, right? Anything is possible. You can also get a patch that you find maybe in Citrus or something that is already made and just reverse engineer it to see how it works and how it's made. But I'll be showing you in this video so you better understand when you do it yourself. It takes exercise to get good snares, so don't give up on your first try. You need to do it over and over and over until you sort of learn. So yeah, we're going to be having fun. So I am now inside of FL Studio. It doesn't matter what DAW you use. And I'm going to load up an instance of Faceplant. Faceplant is by far my favorite synthesizer right now because it's capable of doing so much. And it's a bit more mm, complicated for a beginner to use. But what matters is that you take away what I'm telling you and actually understanding how to apply it yourself. So this is not about doing the exact same thing as me. It's about trying to learn. You don't even need to follow me as long as you understand and you try doing it yourself later. If you find that you don't understand what's happening, then you should probably rewatch or look for other materials too. Although I think I'm going to explain this pretty well. So I'll be starting off by adding an oscillator and I will be mimicking that fundamental tone. So the fundamental tone is usually just a sign. You can use other wave shapes. The only difference really being the way it reacts with distortion and the rest of the elements, right? But this is good for me. I'll be going inside of this envelope here. If I play it right now, you can hear it's just a sign, right? I'll be going inside of my envelope right here and I'll be changing its shape a little bit. I'll give it a bit of attack, just a touch, around 10 milliseconds, so it's a bit softer. I will leave the decay a bit higher and turn the sustain all the way down. What I'm doing is I'm softening it up and making it percussive, as you can hear. Next, since the snare itself doesn't just stay at one pitch, it usually goes down in pitch really fast after you hit it. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing using a different envelope here. I'll be doing the attack at zero because I don't want this to swoop up and down. And I'll be turning the sustain down and the release like this. And I'm going to give it a somewhat short decay and make it somewhat snappy. And I will be taking this and routing it to my pitch. And I'll be turning it up to two octaves. And you can hear it's doing exactly that, right? And what I'll be doing is I'll be turning my snare down one octave. So now you can hear it's somewhat nice. You can also remove the attack if you want it to be snappy, but mm, your choice. And actually, I think I'll keep it like this. You can add a bit of hold too to make it stay a bit while this is happening. Yeah, this is good. Next, I'm going to try and mimic that initial the click from the snare, which is created, as I said, when the drumstick hits the actual snare, right? So I'll be taking a noise and I'll be using an envelope to shorten it and make it basically like a click. I'll be setting it to Sable just so it doesn't sound different every time I hit it. Then I'm going to add another group and I'm going to be mimicking that release of tone that the snare has. So I'll be taking the noise and I'll try to somewhat soften it, add a bit of release to it and basically follow the fundamental but make it longer. Like this. Now you notice that it doesn't really sound like a snare too much and that's because this noise is actually a bit all over the place. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be adding a filter and making it into a high pass. Now it's not affecting the low end but I'll go a step further and now you can start hearing that it sounds pretty good. What I'm effectively doing is I'm cutting out all of the low frequencies that are taken up already by the fundamental. So the fundamental needs that space to stay loud. And I'm boosting this space right here. This being around, let me just check real quick. You can see this is 1K and anywhere between 1 to 2.5K gives you this texture. And this is usually the space where claps lie in real life. A clap is like around this range. 
you can hear that it's like a clap. Next, to give it some more life, we can add some movement to the filter. I'm going to be using an LFO and I'm going to be turning it into a soft like shape like this. I'm going to make it one shot and unipolar. So it goes from the bottom to the top and it only triggers once if I hit it. And then I'm going to be routing it to you. I'm going to be speeding it up a little and you can hear what it's doing. It's creating that tree, tree, tree sound and it's starting to sound like a snare. So all the elements are here and next we just have to mix them together. So I did level them already. So what I only have to do is add stuff like distortion and compression to make it all glued up. So I'm going to start off pretty simply with a bit of distortion and I'm going to hard clip it. What hard clipping does is it basically stops the signal from going any higher than a certain volume, right? So I'm going to be boosting this and I'm going to be boosting the fundamental into it. And now you can start hearing the tone of it. I'm going to duplicate this envelope and create another one that's a little bit shorter. And I will be pitching this up like this. So I have more control over the general pitch shifting aspect of this. And hard clipping is the secret to getting your snares to sound like this. A lot of people don't really know what to do about their snares and this is the trick. So we got this nice tone. Next up, I can add a compressor. So with the compressor, I can control the actual dynamics of the sound before it goes into distortion. So what I'm doing basically is with the threshold, I'm checking where the, the snare hits and I'm pushing it down, as you can see, in such a way that it basically creates a different density of sound that goes into the distortion. With the ratio, I can control how hard the compressor is pushing down on it. With the attack, I can affect how fast it's happening. Next up, I'm going to be using the dynamics to control the tail a bit. So this is the volume curve, right? And basically what's happening is here, I'm just cutting everything that's this low. I'm making it this quiet. So it's effectively shortening the sound. So similar to the other compressor, it also has attack and release that work the same way and a need that you can visibly see what it does. It also has an in and out gain, which uh, work differently. Before distortion, we can also add an equalizer with which I can do all sorts of creating things on the sound. So I can see everything that is happening to it and I can just change it. So I can boost the fundamental. So yeah, usually when you boost the fundamental into the distortion, it's going to obviously distort more and boosting the noise is going to make it sound a bit weird. So this is generally what I do is I just mitigate some stuff to make it sound clean. Next up, after the distortion, because I'm sort of done with it, I'm going to be using Transient Shaper, which is yet again, it's sort of type of distortion that detects the attack and the sustain of the sound and boosts them or reduces them accordingly. As you can hear, it's very clicky and it reduces the tail accordingly. Now I can add a limiter and just like that, it's now like a finished snare, right? Obviously I can change some stuff. If I wanted to sound a bit different, I can add another EQ right before the transient shaper and reduce the fundamental. Because technically the fundamental has already been distorted. I don't need it anymore. You can hear it still sounds the same, right? Or I can even boost it if I want to. I want to play around here where I originally had my filter and to boost the high end. And I'll be adding another distortion actually. And that's it. Good. To your snare, you can also add other sounds or other effects. I'm just going to be showing you this real quick, sort of like a noise. And you can try other stuff in it. For example, I can get, there's a right here. It doesn't sound that great because it's not a good sample, but it's an idea. Right, so we're done in phase plant. Now I'm going to route this to a mixer track and I'm going to start adding effects on it. So I'm going to start very simply and because I already equalized it inside of phase plant and I already did most of the stuff that I wanted to, I'm just going to be doing some very basic things. First, I'm going to start with some distortion that is a wave shaper. And the wave shaper is a very creative type of distortion where you can actually change the distortion type yourself. And what I'll be doing it is I'll just saturate it a bit because I want it to be saturated. And what it's doing is it's basically forcing it to not peak over zero dB. As I mentioned before, the hard clipper stops any of the wave that's louder in a certain volume. And that's exactly what the wave shaper is doing, but it's actually showing it. So if you imagine this is the hard 
clipper. This would be the wave shape going into it, right? And it would be louder. So it would oscillate like this in volume. What it's doing is it basically, wherever it's going like over, it's just making it into a hard line and then it's going back to normal. The same way that I'm doing this is it's also adding square harmonics to it. So the way it oscillates, if it were to oscillate just normally like this, it would push it up and it would add more and more square harmonics. That's why I'm doing this. Ready? Uh, next up, I'm going to be adding a Maximus. And as you can see, it's sort of already turning it down, even though I technically, it technically shouldn't be peaking. And that is because this is a multiband compressor and it splits the sound into multiple bands. The reason why that is important is because it uses equalizers to do that. And the problem behind equalizers is the fact that they affect the phase of the sound. So when you put all the sound back together, it's not the original, it's the original, but with some weird phase shifts, which makes some parts of the sound to basically over overlap and it makes it louder in certain parts and quieter in others. Switching this to linear phase will fix that as you can see. But the problem will be that it will have artifacts like pre-ringing or a little bit of latency, which as you can see in here, it adds 44 milliseconds of latency, which is not desirable. So I'll be using the normal one and I'll just be shaping it a bit. So I'll be turning it down low. I'll force it up. This is similar to that dynamics where the volume is shown like this, right? In a left to right matter. What I'm effectively doing is here where it's zero decibels, where it's speaking, I'm forcing the loudest bit to get over to it, which the loudest bit will always be the transient. So I'm making the transient really loud and then the rest I'm making really tight. So it's going down really quick. You can also change each band individually. So I can make the high end really loud and I can tighten the low end. And lastly, I'm just going to add another wave shaper, boosting it into it. So I got this very distorted snare sound. I can also add another transient shaper, you know, just to, just to control a little. And it adds a little bit of click at the start. And that's my snare. I can change the tone. There's lots to be experimented with. So I have my snare, which is in C5. I can also play it in different notes. And I'll show you now how to render it. So you can either just put down a note like this and then right click and then render as audio clip. And it will give you your snare. Personally, I don't find that to be such a great way of doing it because of inconsistencies that are created by the way FL renders stuff out. I would much rather use Edison. Now, recently I found out that Edison isn't as popular with people, which I don't understand why, but I personally consider it to be quite an amazing tool. Reason being that it records everything that you wanted to record exactly the way that you need it. So I loaded up an Edison on this same mixer track and I'm going to be setting it on input, turning it on. And now I'll just be hitting the note that I needed to play a few times. And now I'll stop recording. And here I have my samples. As you can see, they're just almost about the same. There may be small differences between them. That's why I recorded multiple times and I can audition them. So I'll go to the one that I like and select everything around it and delete it. And I'll zoom in on the initial bit of it and select the first sample that isn't starting to go up and deleting everything else. And then here, wherever it starts going quiet, I'm going to leave a bit of space and deleting. And right at the end here, I'm going to fade out. And then right at the start here, I'm going to be fading in. This helps prevent against DC offset, which can uh, sort of affect your, your sound. It still does have a bit of DC from what I can see, but it's nothing bad. I can drop it in my FL and I can play with it. So you can see it's pretty nice. It has a nice shape and I can do all sorts of things with it. I can pitch it up now. And this is how you can make other snares by pitching up already existing ones and processing them again. And from here, you can do all sorts of other stuff with it, right? Like I said, you can process it again, or you can just do some housekeeping on it and then putting in your sample pack. I'll be doing my housekeeping. So I'll route it to a track, get something to measure it with, and just turn down the volume by six decibels. It's either six decibels, or if you want to keep it loud, I would recommend going at minus one. This is just a sort of like quality control. When you go at minus one, it just means that it's not actually clipping in the mixer. Helps with mixing, right? And when you're at minus six, it's already ready for mix, right? A lot of sample packs take that into consideration and they get their samples readily mixed, readily to be dropped in your sample pack, readily to be dropped in your track. It's ready to be used. So yeah, make sure it doesn't have any other problems. You can also choose to use an equalizer like this 
and just put a high pass as low as possible at the steepest curve. And what this effectively does is it removes the DC if the snare had any to begin with. Be careful that your snare doesn't have DC because then it can lead to it sounding pretty bad. Once you've applied your stuff, which is just my minus six, I suppose, I'll be selecting it. And this time I can just consolidate it. So by pressing Control Alt C, I can quickly consolidate it. Make sure I enable the insert effects and start. And here's my snare. It looks horrible at this low volume because it's a dubstep snare, you know, it's like that. But other types of drums may be useful for you to keep at this low volume. Just for comparison, this is minus one decibels. So you can see that it doesn't really clip. It never hits zero. And that's it. That's your snare completed. I can go out of my FL, you know, drop it on, on my desktop, call it. whatever, and then drop it in my projects and use it, whatever. And that's it. That's it with this uh, whole video. Alrighty. So let's recap quickly what I did before going off. First, I got my synthesizer of choice and I created a fundamental, which I chose to be a sign, but I could use anything I wanted. I changed its envelope so it would match the one of a real snare. And I gave it a pitch shift that I split into two for ease of access, but it works with just one or with an LFL. Then I got a noise, which I layered on top and made really clicky, which acts as the transient. Then lastly, I got another noise, which I high passed around the 1K to 2K area. I turned down the volume a little bit and I made it basically follow the fundamental. I also connected this cutoff of this filter up to a LFO, which brings it up by a bit so it has a bit of movement. Then I used a few compressors. As you can see here, I removed the dynamics, but that is to control the shape of the sound and an EQ to yet again control the frequencies pre-distortion. I ran it into distortion, which I used hard clip for to gain that heavy, nice saturation. I boosted into it. Then I get another EQ with which I correct a few of the frequencies and distort it again. And then a transient shaper with which I just boost the attack a little bit. So it's a bit snappier. I originally also had a limiter, which you can use too if you want to. I then routed it to my effects because the snare is technically done. I just added a little bit of saturation using the fruity wave shaper which made sure that it made it so it doesn't clip. And I boosted it into it. I then got Maximus and did a little bit of housekeeping on the dynamic side of things. So I made sure that it's only affecting the transient here. So I made it click and then turned down the rest of the sound so it's a bit snappier. But again, the high end was turned up a little bit. The low end was made snappier a bit. There's another transient shaper with which I boosted the attack. So yet again, it would become snappy. And another wave shaper, which I didn't even boost actually this time. Just left the way it was so it wouldn't clip. Then using Edison, I recorded it, cut out the bad recordings and just left this one, which I faded in and out nicely and dropped into my project here. I then took what I had, brought it to a different mixer and changed the volume so it was at minus one or minus six decibels and rendered it out. And that was my snare. So yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's actually pretty easy to do. And you can add tons of variation by doing all sorts of other things, like with the transient shaper, playing with distortion types, EQing, different sounds, using acoustic snares and stuff like that. But I will be going over that in a different video. Let's continue on to the next part of the video. First of all, I need to mention that the tools that you use don't actually matter. It's one of those beginner things to believe that, you know, the tools that you use will define how good the sound comes out. And to a certain extent, that is true, but it doesn't apply to beginners because a beginner is not capable of, of making a good tool sound good, right? If you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to get something good either way. Don't base your own capabilities on your tools, base them on yourself, get better, and you'll be able to do more with the tools that you have. And then when you feel like you're really good, you can start investing in things that you feel like are better for you, you know? So yeah, just practice, 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 practice. It, that's what it comes down to. I know a lot of people complain that, oh, I don't want to practice. I want to just get into it. I'm sorry, but you can't go around it. Like if you don't want to work for it, then what are you doing? You got to also have to drive. If you don't enjoy working for it, then maybe music isn't for you. And I mean it, but you should enjoy it because it's music <laughs> and you're here and you're here to learn. So yeah, outside of that, you can make these snares in all sorts of ways. As I said, you can take acoustic snares. You can do stuff with like transient shapers, different sounds. You can use just distortion and no noise. Snares aren't bound to these rules that I gave you in this video. They don't need to have the snap because these are electronic snares. They don't need to sound real. I'm going to get into that in the next video. And I'm going to be using some really cool and advanced techniques to show you 
So if you're more intermediate, you can wait out for that one. But it's probably not going to be my next video because my next video is going to cover color base. Practice is also important. Like I mentioned before, uh, you won't be able to get a good snare without practicing. At first, your snares may sound really weird and off, or they may sound exactly like my video, but you won't know what you're doing and you won't know how to go further with it. Just keep experimenting and don't be afraid of playing around with other people's sounds too and taking those and messing those up. I use a lot of layers when I make my drums. It doesn't all have to be done in a single synthesizer. You can play around a lot with it. But that's about it. That's the entirety of the video. Before I finish, I want to say that please do subscribe if you like this. If you enjoyed this, I'm working really hard on making better videos and higher quality tutorials. And it takes a lot of time because I'm doing a lot of projects and you know how it is. I also have a kick tutorial video in which you can learn how to make kicks yet again for beginners. So if you're a beginner, that may be something that you can check out to actually better understand what happened in this one. You don't rewatch this one, you watch a different one and, <laughs> and you get a bigger salad in your head or something. I'm just kidding. Uh, if you're intermediate and you want to, you know, learn how to make drums, yet again, that video. If you're expert and you want to learn how to make other drums, still check that out because it's cool. Next videos in the series for these, I'm going to try and actually cover more advanced techniques, but that's going to come later. Thank you for watching and thank you for being here and thank you for choosing to learn. So yeah, go and have fun. See ya. Yeah.